And thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Arjun Harindranath from LATAM.tech and we're here today with Jen Sander, uh, Head of Global Innovation at Burning Man. I and mean, we all know about Burning Man. Um, I'm assuming you, you flew in here on your private jet from Burning Man HQ as well. Yeah, right. <laughs> I wish. But I understand you wanted to ask a question, first of all, from, from the audience itself. Uh, yeah. Um, so how many of you guys have actually been to Burning Man here before? Okay, awesome. That's about 10 or so of you. Um, and how many of you have heard of Burning Man? Woohoo! Great. There's actually a local burn here in Miami. Has anyone been to Love Burn? Okay, great. A few of you guys have been. Have you have you been to Burning Man? Never been. Never been. I used to live in um, in Berlin, and uh, Berlin's the kind of city where the underground culture is very much on display. It's uh, it's not hidden, and it's very much out in front. And I always assume that Burning Man has that kind of philosophy as well, where the underground is is very much on display. Yeah, exactly. I mean, well, Burning Man was created by the underground. Uh, people and artists um, and conveners. Berlin and Burning Man have a lot of commonalities, I think. I think that's probably why uh, you made that sort of assumption. Um, both are centers of non-commercial art in a lot of ways. They're places where people are pushing the envelope um, in participatory art and larger scale art. And um, in Berlin, people are very much um, activating spaces and doing rejuvenation projects and kind of looking at the city as a blank canvas in a lot of ways um, that is very similar to uh, the kind of culture that uh, initially uh, galvanized Burning Man culture. Could you tell us a little bit about the evolution? And we know about Burning Man as this city that sort of props up in the desert. Right. And it started off as this very sort of independent movement. And now it's a, it's a non-profit organization. Well, could you tell us a little bit about how that, that change occurred? Yeah, I mean, so Burning Man is a change organization. <laughs> um, if things start to look the same for a period of time, then we know we're in trouble. Um, it's a long history of change, actually. So. Burning Man started in 1986, and as I said earlier, it was very much galvanized by um, sort of artists and creatives and a little bit of an anti-establishment sort of movement. Um, and eventually, by the late 80s, early 90s, um, people started to kind of crave order. You know, so the Department of Public Works emerged, the volunteer department, and um, the Department of Mutant Vehicles for our art cars, and the Rangers who, you know, safely guided people um, back to the city. We, we decided that we wanted order. We naturally and organically started to crave order. So Burning Man, in fact, started to look at real cities um, and started to imagine what they would want in their home for that one week. Um, taking the best of real cities and real models um, into the design. And um, today we are a nonprofit, and this is largely because um, we were capped. We were uh, not able to get any larger in Black Rock City in Nevada. And as a result of that, the founders thought to themselves, you know, we should really look at um, the rest of the world and the rest of the offshoots and cultural um, emergent behavior that's coming from Burning Man um, and become a nonprofit so we can support um, and nurture the, the growth of those things as well. Uh, how did you get into Burning Man to start off with? Did you, have, did you get a chance to go there originally and have some sort of uh, transformative experience? <laughs> Um, well, yes. I mean, for me, it was very transformative. Um, I actually, I didn't tell you this before, but I actually hitchhiked to Burning Man my first time. Um, but no, I was living in the UK and I was um, a part of an early stage incubator and um, I was working with TEDx, um, running TEDx London, and had started experimenting with bringing different startups together during an event situation and trying to encourage them to collaborate and create a larger impact. And um, I became very disheartened with uh, the lack of collaboration that would happen in the conventional kind of conference world or um, temporary event kind of networking thing. And 
Uh, at the same time, a friend of mine convinced me to come to Burning Man and uh, invited me to a pop-up incubator in the heart of Burning Man. It was a camp called ID8. And so we were a bunch of people who self-organized um, at Burning Man for things that were meant for the real world. And so we were prototyping things for the real world at Burning Man. And all of that just coincided in a way where I sort of you know, realized that I had a network and a community of people who were more focused on the ideas around building and creating and doing more than storytelling. Um, and that, you know, I would love to spend more time sol helping to solve the problems of the Burning Man community, which were, you know, how can we um, connect these different groups? How can we help them create a larger impact as a result of what they're doing versus the kind of TED mentality, which is more just um, sharing ideas but no route to engagement. If you were to put your finger on it, how, what, what does innovation at Burning Man look like? Well, what's an innovation city at Burning Man? So the whole thing is an idea, right? The whole thing is an experiment and it's largely run by artists. It's an, it's an artist city. And um, so everything from how the city is designed, where we have our civic institutions at the heart of the city, um, and you know, the, the actual city itself is designed to push you to be curious, to explore, to play. Um, the city is designed in a radial manner whereby it's almost like a clock. So at six o'clock is the man and the temple is behind it. And the city um, is from three to nine. So basically it's like a, a benchmark of, of you know, the, the time, but it's also pushing you to explore and get lost. So it's kind of got this uh, dynamic kind of design that encourages one to push themselves beyond the comforts of the unknown. Um, and so that combined with the art, um, which, you know, artists for a long time have been the ones who visually conceptualize their ideas um, in ways that other people can interact with them. They prototype and they share their thoughts and visions of the future. So Burning Man being this art state um, and also a prototype city where other people are prototyping and designing temporary structures um, within this sort of awe-inspiring kind of framework um, really, really encourages innovative outcomes, right? It's basically a Petri dish. And you've talked earlier, I had a chance to see one of your talks, um, TED, TEDx talks, and you mentioned this concept of play, this idea of of freeform storytelling. How does that sort of play out in, in, in Burning Man philosophy? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. Um, so play is a fundamental element of innovation that I firmly believe in and, you know, um, I think it has to do with nonlinear learning. It has to do with learning through uh, being resourceful and, you know, Play, touching things, learning through exploration and curiosity. Um, and, and we have principles at Burning Man that focus on participation. Um, and so it's really about getting your hands dirty and, and, and creating space for the unknown. So as it relates to storytelling, um, I'm not so sure, but I think that the, the, the element of play that is really, really important um, within Burning Man is um, really stepping into the unknown and having the permission to enter into a space for a week where you can step outside of the way society normally operates. We just had a mic change. Yes. <laughs> is that clearer? All right. Um, I'm interested in exploring this idea of play a little bit further because you also want to talk about collaboration. Right. Is, there a, is there this sort of internal conflict between the idea of anything goes and the fact that we all have to, to work together? Yeah, so that, so I mentioned earlier that play, is, there's a permission engine for play, you know, so you, you're stepping into Burning Man, you're allowed to kind of do things you wouldn't normally do, um, and the, the permission engine is also exemplified by our principles. And this idea of radical self-reliance, where you have to you know, build your shelter, bring everything you need, you can't buy anything, take your garbage out with you, um, combined with the principle of collective effort, whereby you know, participation I mentioned, and you know, getting involved, experimenting, helping out with a large project that maybe you've never even thought you were capable of you know, supporting previously, that kind of 
dynamic kind of push and pull of the different opposite sides of, of being, um, they definitely encourage that kind of exploration and collaboration. Um, and play is all about curiosity, getting lost in time, doing things for no reason and not being overly committed to outcomes. Um, but I wanna point out that this idea of entering into you know, a state of play, it, it can be philosophical, but it can also be um, physical. So Burning Man is a great example of kind of like a physical as well as philosophical uh, permission space. But um, in, in cities and throughout time, there are actual physical places referred to as third spaces or, or the magic circle. Some people in the gaming industry, they call it the magic circle, where, you know, you do allow freedom and connectivity to guide your decision making. So these are places like the Italian piazza, um, the coffee house, you know, um, the saloon, um, green spaces, you know, places where you kind of create time to step out of your routine um, and in, into the unknown. Do you have a favorite Burning Man law? Because I know there are some sort of 10 principles of, of Burning Man. Do you have a, one that sticks out for you that you always live by? Right, so I was, the, some of the things I mentioned pre previously were those principles. So participation, radical self-reliance, communal effort, gifting is a really big good one too. Um, decommodification, so nothing is bought or sold there. Um, immediacy, one of my favorite ones, I think it's participation and gifting are my favorite. Um, I think those are the ones that really do lead to that sense of play and, and abundance, that mentality of abundance versus scarcity. And Burning Man HQ itself is in, is in San Francisco, is that? That's right. Um, our headquarters is in San Francisco. Um, I, I'm all over the place, and there's a few of us who kind of bounce around, but for the most part, yeah, that's where all my colleagues are. I imagine when people think of Burning Man, the last thing they think of are uh, office space or of offices. Could you give us an idea, for those of us who don't get a chance to go to San Francisco, what, what, what does it look like at Burning Man HQ? Right, um, so our offices are wonderful. Um, they, well, it's just one office. It is um, in the Mission in San Francisco and it's a large open space environment uh, that really, really encourages that kind of flow and um, random collisions of people running into each other. And the whole thing is designed actually like a, uh, a gallery and a storybook. So if, we, if you come down, I could give you a tour and basically, um, as you go through the building, you can um, go through the narrative of our journey from 1986 to current time. Fantastic. Um, and that's pretty much the, the time we have. So I just want to, to thank you, Jen Sander from, from Burning Man. I really appreciate it for, for talking to us. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah.